I was trying to solve this terrible puzzle that confronted me for, and many other people about how it was that human beings got themselves in such a tangle about what they believed. Such a tangle that we were pointing the ultimate weapons of destruction at one another, which, by the way, we are still doing. And I thought, okay, well, I understand that. We need our belief systems. They orient us. And that means there will be conflict between belief systems, and that can be a catastrophe. And that's being played out everywhere, again, in very many ways. What's the solution to that? Well, one possibility is there's no solution. It's just mayhem all the way around. Could be the case. But it seemed to me, as I delved into it, that the proper solution to that was to live properly. As an individual. Because you're more powerful than you think. Way more powerful than you think. I mean, God only knows what you are in the final analysis. You're blind to your own weaknesses, but you're also blind to your own strengths. And so then I think, well, if you got your act together, it'd be better for you. And instantly it would be better for your family, assuming they wanted you to get your act together. And not everyone does. But, and then it would be better for the community. It's like, how far could you take that? If you stopped wasting time and if you stopped lying and if you oriented yourself to, to the highest possible good that you could conceive of and you committed to that, how much good could you do? Well, I would say, why don't you find out? So, that's what I think you should do. You should find out. You don't have anything better to do. And there's nothing in it, as far as I've been able to tell, there's nothing in it but good. So, maybe you could sort yourself out so that you wanted nothing but the good. And, and then maybe you could help make that manifest in the world. And maybe we wouldn't have all these terrible problems then. At least we'd have fewer of them and that would be a start. So, it's, the, it's the, the answer to the problem of humanity is the, is, the, is the integrity of the individual. That's the answer. So, and states that are predicated on that realization are healthy. So, and states that aren't are doomed to stagnation and catastrophic collapse. And personalities that are predicated on Self-tyranny and the tyranny of others are doomed and doomed to collapse. So, and then you think, well, what's the barrier? And the barrier is, are you willing to accept the responsibility? And part of the answer to that is, reduce the damn responsibility until it's tolerable. You don't have to fix everything at once. You could just start by fixing the things that you could fix. Or you could even do it more. You could do it with even less self-sacrifice. You could start by fixing only the things that you want to fix. God, you can get a massive way that way. So, do it. See what happens. That's what you should have been taught in university, right from the beginning. It's like, aim at the highest good. Tool yourself into something that can attain it. And go out there and manifest it in the world. And everything that, everything that comes your way will be... Everything that comes your way will be a blessing. And so, all you have to do is give up your resentment and your hatred. I know that's a hard thing to give up, because you have plenty of reason for it. You see, the thing about disciplining someone, let's say, is that when you, and I see this very clearly when I'm talking to young people, is that I'm really on the side of the person that wants to do something positive with their life, to make their own life better, because I think that's where you should start. You should start by making, maximizing the quality of your own life. That's not a selfish thing, or if it is, it's the right kind of selfishness. And that you should figure out how to do that in a way that's of benefit to your friends and your family and your community, and you should take that deadly seriously. And the reason you should do that is because that just makes life better for everyone. And it, it, re it reduces a fair bit of the misery that would otherwise be part and parcel of life and it makes everything function smoothly. And one of the things I'm really curious about is what the world would be like if everybody decided to do that because human beings are really remarkable creatures and we hobble ourselves very badly with deception and resentment and revenge and the desire to make things worse and arrogance and all those, all those sins, let's say, that 
that that make us deviate from our true path and our true path should be something like imagine the noblest aim that you can conceptualize and then sacrifice your life to attempting to attain it and there's nothing in that that isn't good for everyone and so apart from the fact that it requires a lot of responsibility i just can't see why everyone wouldn't do that and when i'm talking to young people and you know shaking my finger and saying you know grow the hell up and get mature and take on some responsibility i'm not saying that because i'm an enemy of the person i'm saying it because i'm the best friend of the part of them that would really like to walk in the light and and it's an invitation to walk in the light and and it would be remarkable this is what we need to do as far as i'm concerned not only in the west but in the world at large but maybe in the west first is we have to consciously decide that we're going to do everything we can as individuals to walk in the light and to regard that as a noble and heroic endeavor and to make that first and foremost in our lives and that's what we should be educating young people to do and they can do that and so i have dozens of people writing to me and and talking to me all the time who are saying the same thing they're saying look i've really been trying to get my act together over the last 6 months i've been trying not to lie which is slightly different than trying to tell the truth right it's a more humble goal to not lie because you can tell when you're lying but you can't necessarily tell when you're telling the truth and i i've been coming up with a plan and i've been trying to discipline myself and i've been cleaning up my room which is like a nice humble act that that involves transforming chaos into order and they write and say god things are just working out way better for me it's like whoa do it man that's just you you keep that up for 15 years and you'll be unbeatable and that's what we should be convincing young people to be is to be unbeatable and not because that's what they should do or because they're bad if they don't but because there's nothing better you can possibly do with your limited and uh, your limited and suffering bound life than to aim high and and sacrifice yourself to the attainment of those goals so do you have problems in your life that you're not addressing that you could solve and the answer is yes and it's an easy thing to figure out you sit on your bed one morning and say okay there's some things that need to be done that i don't want to do that i could do that would make things better by the end of the day what are they well your your conscience will deliver those suckers in no time flat man <laughs> and then you might have to say okay well how do i entice myself into doing a few of those and if you ask instead of trying to force yourself to do it like you're a tyrant and a slave at the same time you can usually negotiate with yourself so that you'll start to sort those things out sort them out put your house in order and then move out move on <laughs> and out <laughs> yes that's a freudian slip by the way yeah so it's important because the thing is you you have a practice domain right there are, there are things that are within your grasp that you could fix fix them and you'll learn you'll learn because it's harder than it looks fix them and you'll learn how to fix things and then something else will beckon as another problem that you could fix you know you all have your problems what does that mean like there's an infinite number of problems in the world some of them happen to be yours why is that i don't know exactly but you have your problems great solve them you know one of the thing i learned as a therapist every therapist has to learn this is because one of the things you wonder when you're first starting to be a clinician is how do you not take the catastrophes of your clients home with you and the answer to that is because it's immoral to they're not your problems they're their problems like they're they're their life you know your problems are your life you don't want to solve someone else's problems for them because you take away the the deep meaning that's to be found in having them work through the problems on their own and then you steal the credit well i can help you with that it's like well yeah maybe but i don't help you with the next problem then so in any case you sort sort out the problems that are right in front of you and you will it will make you grow very very rapidly and then you'll be able to sort out more complex problems without making them worse How does it feel to be viewed as a father figure by many people who grew up without one? Well, um I think it's an unbelievable honor. How's that? And that is really what I think. I think it's a tremendous honor and I'm doing absolutely everything I can 
to be worthy of that. And I would like to say to all the people out there who grew up without a father, that's really too bad because you need a father there to encourage you. That's what fathers do, is they encourage, they help make you courageous. And if I can help people develop the capacity to be courageous and to learn to tell the truth and to be responsible, then that's great. I, I, I can't imagine a better outcome for me. And so if people are willing to help me play that role and to use what I've been teaching to guide them in that manner, then hooray, I couldn't possibly imagine a better outcome than that. Know when you know you should do something. I mean, everyone has the, this experience, I believe. Perhaps you would be willing to put up your hands if this experience is foreign to you. Okay? There's part of you telling you you should do something. And it's hard to do it. Effortful. And maybe you're afraid of it. And so you don't do it. You just procrastinate. Right? And so how do you feel about that? Good? I mean, so what you feel that you're betraying yourself. Your anxiety actually gets worse, not better, even though, you know, you can put it off moment to moment, but that doesn't help because every time you put it off, the anxiety just grows a little bit. You're not proud of yourself. You have a sense that you're making things more chaotic than they should be. You know, and if you do that long enough, and I'm sure many of you have had that experience, if you do that long enough, if that becomes habitual, things will get so stormy around you that you'll fall right into the, into the chaos, into the watery chaos and maybe you'll drown so it's not a very good idea to run from your destiny let's say whatever that might be and you need a destiny you need a place to aim at because that's what gives your life meaning and you need meaning in your life because life is hard so you know you need something to buttress yourself against that so anyways they wake Jonah up and Jonah says, eh, that's probably my fault because like I'm running away from something I'm supposed to do and you know, God isn't very happy about that so why don't you just throw me over, overboard? And the crew isn't very happy about that but the waves are really starting to come up and Jonah's pretty insistent that he's the cause of the problem and so they draw, they draw lots and, and Jonah is chosen and so they decide to toss him into the ocean and immediately everything's calm. So he's a center of chaos, because he's not doing what he's supposed to do. Fine. Well, then a whale comes up and swallows him. And then he's in the whale for three days. That's a weird thing. The whale, that's the whale that, that Geppetto's in. That's a dragon. It's that thing that you have to go out there and conquer to get something of value. Now, when you've made an error, when you've fallen off the, the pathway when you deviated from what you know you should do. It produces a state of internal chaos and worry and concern. You're, you're thrust into the unknown. You're thrust into unknown territory and chaos. You don't know what to do. And that's often symbolized by the encounter with a, with a monster, like a dragon. Or something that lives under the water. That's, and I think the reason for that is, as far as I've been able to tell, is that Human beings, because we've been prey animals for forever, we have a, a system in our mind that's a threat predator detection system. That's the thing that makes little kids think about monsters in the dark, right? Because while well, there is monsters in the dark, parents always say, well, there's no monsters in the dark. It's like, that's not true. The dark is full of monsters. There might not be any in your room right at that moment, but that doesn't mean there aren't monsters in the dark. And crimes take place, like criminals don't get up at six in the morning and like, you know, have breakfast and go rob a bank. They do it, they do that sort of thing at night. People do the things that are fit for the night in the night. And lots of predators are nocturnal. And you can't see very well in the dark. And kids aren't stupid, you know. They've evolved to stay pretty damn close to the fire. When you're feeling terrible, you don't say, well, I'm feeling up. You say, I'm feeling down. Well, why is that? Well, 
down is worse. I guess you're flat on the ground when you're down or you're in a hole or something like that. You're hiding in a hole. You know, it's down. And you're threatened by something, you know. Maybe you're threatened by your own inadequacy. That might be part of it. Maybe that's partly what you imagine as a monstrous force because, you know, your proclivity towards procrastination and your weakness of character is part and parcel of why you happen to be in the underworld. And that's the underworld, the mythological underworld. That's where you go when things fall apart. And if you understand that, if you know that that's what that means, then you have one of the keys that opens up ancient stories to you. And you understand things. You can, your life can be in, organized, going very well. And then something comes up. And poof, everything changes. Some axiom that you were living by, and it might be the existence of a partner, it might be a job, it might be your health, any of those things. Gone. And you go somewhere when that happens. You go somewhere. It's a state of being. You're still in the same world, but it's not the same at all anymore. Everything about it is different. It's all negative and dark, and you don't know what to do. You're confused. And so, what do you do down there in the underworld when things have fallen apart? Especially if, if it's the worst possible case scenario and you realize that you actually had something to do with your demise. That's really annoying, you know, when something bad happens to you and then, you know, you grind yourself into bits trying to figure out what the hell happened and then you realize that, well, you were playing a causal role. Now, sometimes you're so depressed you assume you're playing a causal role and you weren't, it's not easy to figure out by any stretch of the imagination. And it isn't that everyone who does something terrible is at fault for it. But sometimes you find that you were off the path somehow, and maybe even that you knew it and you didn't attend to it. And that's why all of this hit the fan. And so then down there in that chaos, you decide that you're going to do what you're supposed to do instead. And then maybe you get to rise up again, renewed, if you're lucky, and then you can go fix the city. And that's what this story is about. And that's why I picked the image to represent the course, because really what happens, you see, with the psychoanalysts, the road to, to health, if you're not doing well, which means that as you act in the world, you're not getting what you want. There's something wrong with your, the match between your presuppositions and your actions habitual, and the way the world is responding to you. And so it's not turning out for you. And the question is, well, what can you do about that? And one answer might be to examine yourself for presuppositions and action patterns that are not serving you well, and to find out what they are and what to do about them. And maybe some of that is, maybe you're not moving forward because of fear, and maybe that fear is grounded in terrible experiences that you had in the past that you've never been able to understand. And maybe one of the ways of gluing yourself back together and expanding your personality so that you could, in fact, live properly in the world is to go back to those terrible events and untie them and straighten them out and understand them and drop them. And that's what psychotherapy is about, in large part. Psychoanalytic, behavioral, doesn't matter. What are you afraid of? What are you avoiding? What are you failing to develop? Maybe from fear. Maybe from avoidance. God only knows. Maybe from disgust. How can you get over it? How can you reclaim those parts of yourself? So the question is, why, don't, why do people pursue rewards that don't produce this resonance? They don't have a value hierarchy. So Pleasure Island, it's a good example. Those kids that were brought there were lost. So they didn't, they didn't have anywhere to go. They didn't have an identity. So they default to local pleasure. And that's better than none. Although the problem with local pleasure, well, as the narrative made clear, is that you better look out if you're impulsive because it's going to kick back on you hard. And the reason is you're only considering the immediate time frame. And the problem is, is that Things propagate across all the time frames. And so just because something works really well this second, cocaine, for example, doesn't mean that it's a tenable solution to the class of all problems. So usually, often, people pursue local pleasure because 
That's the best they can imagine. It's the best they've been taught. They don't see another alternative. So it could be ignorance. It can be they don't want to adopt the responsibility because part of the problem with working at every level of the hierarchy simultaneously is that it's, it's, well, it's like dancing to a very complex waltz, let's say. You have to be paying attention to a very large number of things simultaneously and doing things right. It requires responsibility. And so, you know, that's, it's a pain. It's a weight. Part of the reason people drink alcohol is to get rid of their responsibility. I mean, that's, you know, you hear people drink because they have problems. It's like, yeah, yeah, no. Some people drink because they're anxious and alcoholics drink because they're in withdrawal. But young people drink because they're sick and tired of being responsible, because it's annoying. It's like, so I'll drink enough, I won't care about the medium to long-term consequences, because alcohol, that's exactly what alcohol does. It doesn't make you ignorant of the medium to long-term consequences, but it makes you not care about them. And partly it's because it dampens anxiety. So it dampens anxiety, leaves your positive emotion circuits intact, so then you can go out there and do stupid fun things. And that's like, that's a party really. Let's go do stupid fun things. That's a party. But the medium to learn long-term consequences are, it's risky. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it's risky. So yeah, they don't know better. That's the answer, I would say. As you improve, the probability that each improvement will produce a further improvement increases. And so perhaps the, the downside is the cataclysmic catastrophe that you can engage upon if you reproduce your moral failings. But the upside is that each improvement produces an increment in the probability of the next improvement. And I've seen that. It's a truism among behavioral psychologists. I mean, although they don't generally phrase it that way. If you're a behavioral psychologist, and I am a behavioral psychologist, what you do is you find out what, essentially you help per, a person establish their aim, and then you break down what they're trying to do into attainable units, and you negotiate with them. You say, well, look, you know, um, well, I'm not, they say, I'm not making use of my time very well, I'm spending three hours a day playing video games. And you say, well, okay, Hypothetically, how much time would you like to spend playing video games? And they say, well, I could probably spend an hour a day without it interfering with the rest of my life. Which is kind of the issue, right? Because if you play video games, fine. But maybe three hours means that you're not doing your homework or something, and that's not a good game. So you say, okay, well, I want to play for an hour a day. It's like, okay, well, can you shift to an hour a day right now? And this is supposed to be an honest conversation. And the person says, no, I've tried that lots of times. Every time I try, I just fail. And so you don't say, well, quit failing, go play one hour a day, and the problem will be solved. That's a stupid strategy. You say, okay, well, look, you think about this, and don't agree to do this unless you think you will do it, because otherwise it's just a waste of both of our times. It's like, do you think that you could track how much time you've spent playing video games for one week? Don't change anything. Just track it. And they think, yeah, I could probably do that, but I might miss a couple of days. And you think, okay, fine. So here's the deal. Five out of the next seven days, you just track how much time you spent playing video games. And the person says, I think I can do that. Because that's what you want them to say. You want them to succeed at the improvement. It's not much of an improvement, but it's something, right? Then they come back and they say, well, yeah, I was playing about four hours a day. And so you say, okay, well, fine. Good work, man. You've got to track. Now we know what... We know the parameters of your problem. It's actually a little worse than you thought, but at least you had enough sense to measure it. We know where you're at. Okay, do you think you could cut that down to three and a half hours every day? And the person thinks, mm, no, I'm pretty weak-willed. I don't think I could manage that. <laughs> you say, well, how about this? Do you think that two of the next seven days you can only play for three hours? You think you can manage that. And you don't, you're not cynical about this. You're not insulting the person, any of that. It's like, because you don't care. All you care is that they make some incremental movement towards their goal. And the person thinks about that if they have any sense and they take their weakness into account and they think, I think I could probably do that. And then they come back the next week 
and they say, I managed to spend three hours a day playing video games for three days, and the rest were four hours. And you say, good work, man. You've just got rid of 12.5% of your problem. You're one-eighth of the way to fixing it in one week. And, you know, the person isn't going to be all that thrilled with themselves because they don't do the arithmetic they do, and they don't do the projection. They think, well, I'm still pretty damn useless. I'm playing 25 hours worth of video games a week. It's nothing to pat myself on the back for. It's like, yes, it is. It's definitely, it's a marked, measurable improvement, and it's a move in the right direction. You know, and then you say, okay, well, on the days you succeeded, how did you manage to succeed? And is there a way that you could... Do it for four days next week. How about that? Or, or maybe you could even try five days. You think you could do that? And then you also tell the person, look, the other thing you've got to understand is you're not going to improve like this. You're going to improve like this. So some weeks you're going to come back and say, geez, I backslid completely and I like played for four hours a day for seven days. But it doesn't matter because that doesn't mean you failed. It just means that you slid back. You want to calculate it over a month or something like that. And, you know, generally speaking, a month later, the person's down to something like two hours a day, and you've figured out ways of filling their time in with something productive otherwise, and, and they're on their way. And the general consequence of that is that every time they manage an accomplishment, they get a little stronger in character, they get a little bit more confident in their ability, they get a little bit less racked with self-disgust, they get a little bit more hopeful about the future and they get more confident that they can make another change. And if you're patient, and you have to be patient with yourself that way, it's like you reward those incremental improvements and you don't get all cynical about them. And you think, okay, just imagine what would happen if you kept doing that every week for 10 years. And the answer to that is, things would be so much better for you that you can't even imagine it. Life is suffering. Right. Indisputable. What do you do about that? You, you voluntarily accept it. And then strive to overcome the suffering that's a consequence of that. And you do that for you, and you do that in a way that makes it better for other people. And then that works. And one question might be, well, how well does it work? And the answer is, you have the only way that you can find out is by trying it. That's it. That's the existential element of it. The proof is to be derived by the incarnation of the attitude in your own life. No one can tell you how it will work for you. It's the thing that your destiny is to discover that. And you have to make, you have to make the decisions to begin with. It's like, because you can't do this without commitment. You have to commit to it first. That's the act of faith that, that Kierkegaard was so insistent upon. You have to say, I'm going to act as if being is good. I'm going to act as if truth is the pathway to enlightenment. I'm going to act as if I should pursue the deepest meaning possible in my life. And there's, there's reasons to do none of those. They're real reasons. So it's really a decision. But you, you can't find out what the consequence of the decision is unless you make the decision. I think the same thing happens when you get married, by the way. So it, if you think you might leave, you're not married. And then you think, well, the marriage didn't succeed. It's like, well, maybe you were never married. Because the rule is, you don't get to leave. And there's a reason for that rule. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't situations where there should be exceptions made for that. That's not the point. The point is that there's some games you don't get to play unless you're all in. And the other thing that's so interesting about being alive is that you're all in. No matter what you do, you're all in. This is going to kill you. So I think you might as well play the most magnificent game you can while you're waiting. Because do you have anything better to do? Really? Why not pick the best thing possible that you could do? Why not do that? Maybe you could justify your wretched existence to yourself that way. I think you could. That's what it looks like. You know, people find such meaning in the responsibilities they adopt, it stops making them ask questions about what life is for. If you have a newborn child, for example, like unless you're really in a bad way, psychotically depressed, or, or maybe your personality really needs some retooling, you stop thinking about anything but ensuring that that baby is doing well. 
And if someone comes along and asks you an existential question about your commitment to that, the right response is, why are you asking me such stupid questions when, when, the, when this, this is manifesting itself right in front of your eyes? Like, how blind can you be? That isn't a time for, for questions about the meaning of life. The answer is right in front of you. And if you can't see it, it's not because life has no meaning, it's because you're blind. I mean, that's what the image of, of, of the Virgin Mother and the child is all about. It's like, what's the answer to the meaning of life? Here's an answer. It's like, well, I'm going to criticize that. Well, go right ahead. You know, it's like, it's like, what, what, you're, you're like a, you're like a, what do you call that? A termite gnawing on a temple. There's no, there's no utility in that sort of criticism. You're, it's blindness. And it's the same thing with regards to the path of the hero. It's like, it glistens in front of you and you can criticize it. It's like, fine. Put the cart before the horse and, and see how far you get. You know, when you hear people like Joseph Campbell say things like, follow your bliss, you know, and so that sounds pretty easy. You want to develop your personality, just do what you love. You know, it's a corruption of Carl Jung's thinking because Jung would say, well, follow what you're interested in, it'll take you somewhere you really don't want to go, and then maybe you'll learn something. So, and that's a whole different. That's a whole different proposition. So, human beings, if you talk about a human being, you tend to use something that's like a story. And when you recount your own being, you tend to use something like a story. And that sort of begs the question, you know, does that mean, in fact, that your experience is either a story or something like a story? One of the things Jung said, I really like this, is you should figure out which story you're living. Because you're living a story. And it might be a tragedy. And so, you know, you want to find out, because if it's a tragedy, you don't come to a very good end. Another thing Jung said was, this is also worth thinking about, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And so what Jung would say is that if you're living out a tragedy, the tragedy has you. You don't have it. And if you can figure out what the tragedy is that has you in its grip, then you have a fighting chance of escaping from it into a more pleasing plot. But it's no easy thing. You know, so if you're one of those people to whom the same terrible thing keeps happening over and over, after the third time, approximately, you might ask yourself, you know, is this the world or is this me? I like the triangle idea. I mean, I don't know why God is wearing a triangular hat. It's a, kind of a strange fashion choice. But I think it's associated with the idea of the pyramid. And I think that's associated with the idea of the hierarchy of authority. And I think that's why the Egyptians put their pharaohs inside pyramids. I know there's more to it than that. But I think some of that has to do with the notion of this hierarchical structure. You see this on the... Now, that's speculative, obviously. And I don't want to make too much of it. But, but I can't help but think that there's something to that. See, that's on the back of the American dollar bill. I like that a lot. That's like the eye of Horus from the Egyptians. And so the idea here is something like at the top of the hierarchy is something that is no longer part of the hierarchy, right? So if you move up the hierarchy enough, what happens is that you develop the ability as a consequence of moving up that hierarchy to be detached enough from the hierarchy so you're no longer really part of it and so that you can move in all sorts of different hierarchies. And the thing, the idea here is that the thing that you're really developing is the capacity to pay attention. And I would say from a... From a mythological perspective, the, the one thing that seems to compete with the idea of the spoken word as the, as the source of the extraction of habitable order from chaos is the eye, is the capacity to pay attention. So Marduk, for example, the Mesopotamian creator god, who, who, who emerged in the hierarchy of Mesopotamian gods and came out at the top, right? He was the victor of the gods. He had eyes all the way around his head and he could speak magic words. And I really like that. I really like that idea. And, and the Egyptians developed that idea too because their god Horus was the eye. Everyone knows the eye of Horus. That, 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 that image is so compelling that we still know about. Everybody has seen the eye of Horus with a really open pupil. And what the Egyptians learned was that the open eye was what revivified the dead society. It's so smart. So what do you do if your life isn't in order? Bloody well, pay attention. And that isn't the same as thinking. It's a different process. Paying attention 
Thinking is like the imposition of structure in some sense. I know I'm oversimplifying, but paying attention is something like watching for what you don't know. And so, like, one of the things I often recommend to my clinical clients if they're having trouble with a family member is, number one, shut up. Don't tell them anything about yourself. Just, and I don't mean in a rude way, it's just like, no more personal information. Number two, watch them like a hawk and listen. And if you do that long enough, they will tell you exactly what they're up to. And they will also tell you who they think you are. And then you'll be shocked because they think you're something, generally speaking, that's not like you, what you are at all. And when they tell you, it's like a revelation to both of you. But attention is an unbelievably powerful force. And you see this in psychotherapy too, because a lot of what you do, and in any reparative relationship, is really pay attention to the other person. Pay attention and listen. And you, you would not believe what people will tell you or reveal to you if you watch them as if you want to know, instead of watching them so that you'll have your prejudices reinforced. That's usually how people interact. It's like, I want to keep thinking about you the way I'm thinking about you, and so I'm going to filter out anything that disproves my theory. That's not what I'm talking about at all. It's like, I'm going to watch you and figure out what you're up to. Not in a rude way, none of that. I just want to see what's there. And that'll be good for you, probably, and also be good for me. And so, well, so that's the idea that, you know, climbing up a hierarchy of authority can give you vision, and that vision can transcend the actual hierarchy. More ideas of hierarchy, same idea. This is, right, gold, silver, bronze. Why gold? Gold is the sun. Gold is pure, right? And so the idea is that the thing that's at the top of the hierarchy is incorruptible because gold doesn't mix with anything else, right? It's this sort of metal that doesn't ever become corrupted. It's a noble metal. It doesn't become corrupted. And so... like the sun and it's associated with what's ever at the top of the hierarchy and the gold the gold medal is a disc like the sun and it's awarded to those people who've who've occupied the top position and who are manifestations of the ideal and here and here's here's I'll tell you a quick story so imagine that you're watching an Olympic contest I, I found this happens to me very often with gymnastics because the gymnasts are so absolutely unbelievable you know so you go you watch a gymnastic performance and uh, the person's out there bouncing around like so, you know, you can't even imagine doing it. They're so perfect at it. So you see this person, they're going through this routine, they're just absolutely spectacular and flawless at it. You know, at the end, they stop and everybody claps and, and they're all excited to see what a human being can do and that's why we're in the audience watching because we want to see what a human being can do. And the judges go like 9.8, 9.8, 9.8, .8, everybody's thrilled. And then the next contestant comes out and it's like, well, they're just basically screwed, right? It's like this person came out there and was perfect. How are you going to top that? That's an interesting question, because this is a representation of what you do to top perfection itself. And you can do it, and here's how you do it, and you know this, even though you don't know, you know it. So let's say the next contestant comes out, and they're kind of shaky, because it's like, oh man, the bar's been raised high. So what they do is, they put themselves right on the edge of chaos. And you can tell by watching them that they are one bloody fraction of a second from catastrophe. They're pushing themselves farther than they've ever gone in the direction of their perfection. And everyone in the room is so tense they can hardly stand it, right? You can hear a pin drop and that person is flipping around and they're just, it's just right on the edge of catastrophe. And at the end they go like this, you know? And there's that gesture that, of triumph that goes along with that. And everybody rises in one instant and just claps like mad. It's like, well, wh why? What are you doing? What are you doing when you're doing that? Right? You can't even help it. It grabs you right in the core of your being, and you stand up, and it's, it's an act of worship, that's what it is, and you saw someone 
go beyond their perfection into the domain of chaos and establish order right in front of your eyes. And you're so thrilled about that, you, you know, you're happy to be alive and everyone's celebrating it all at the same time. And, and it's an, an absolutely amazing thing. And that's what, well, sometimes that's what this represents and sometimes that's what this represents. And that's what we're trying to get at, that, because that's at the pinnacle of the hierarchy, right? Not only are you doing what you should be doing, but you're doing it in a way that increases the probability that you'll do it better the next time you do it. And then you could say, here's another thing to think about along the same lines. You tell your kids to play fair, right? You say, it's not, a, it's not whether or not you win, it's how you play the game. And you say that and you don't really know what you mean. You feel kind of stupid saying it even though you know it's true. And your kid looks at you like there's something wrong with you because he doesn't know what you're talking about either. But you know it's true. And so here's why it's true. Life isn't a game, it's a set of games. And the rule is, never sacrifice victory across the set of games for victory in one game. Right? And that's what it means to play properly. You want to play so that people keep inviting you to play. Because that's how you win. Right? You win by being invited to play the largest possible array of games. And the way you do that is by manifesting the fact that you can play in a reciprocal manner every time you play, even if there's victory at stake. And that's what makes you successful across time. And we all know that, and we even tell our kids that, but we don't know that we know it. And so we're not adapting ourselves to the game and victory in the game. We're adapting ourselves to the meta game and victory across the set of all possible games. And that's what that, well, that's exactly what, as far as I can tell, that's exactly what this is aiming at too. That that's the same idea that there's, that there's a transcend, there's a mode of being that transcends the particularities of the, of the localized contest. That's the other way to think about it. And to act morally is not to win today's contest at the expense of the rest of possible contests. There's an absolute moral, there's an absolute moral stance there and everyone recognizes it. And, and I also think it, it's the key to success. And I would also say it's very much akin in a strange way. Like the, uh, the, the person who is the master at being invited to play the largest possible games, number of games is also the same person. I haven't quite figured out the, the precise relationship between these two, is also the same person that goes out forthrightly to conquer the unknown before it presents itself as the enemy at the door. They're the same thing. And it's a critique in some sense also of the idea of the patriarchy. I know, because the patriarchy is this dominant, oppressive hierarchy that everyone's embedded in. And, you know, the social constructionist... social justice warrior, postmodernist types think about that as a social construction. It's like, how about no? That's just wrong. Lobsters have hierarchies. That's a third of a billion years ago. Okay, that's not a social construction. It's part of being itself. And if you only see a hierarchy as power and, and tyranny, then you're looking at the world wrong. Like, it's true that hierarchies can be tyrannical and dominant. Mm -hmm. And, and a degenerated hierarchy is nothing but tyranny. But in a functional society, the, the hierarchy is actually the structure of the society and you're actually protected within it. Well, then how you relate to that hierarchy is very important, but that's part of personal development. That's part of standing upright, you know? And then people in the hierarchy think, oh, well, you're someone who could do good things for the hierarchy. Let's promote you. Yeah. You know, like men don't struggle for power. That isn't what men do, not if they're civilized. They size each other up and elect the competent to lead them. 
And they do that at every level of society. Like I tell a story in there about, might be later in, in another chapter, it doesn't matter. I worked in a rail crew in, in, in southern Saskatchewan. They're rough guys, like a lot of them had been in prison, you know. And when you first came onto the rail crew, you got a stupid nickname and people teased you. And I remember this one kid called Lunch Bucket. That was his nickname because he came to the rail crew with a lunch bucket that looked like his mom had packed it. That was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. You bring your damn lunch in kind of a you know, ratty paper bag. Right. And you don't make too big a thing out of and it. And it's you know? dirty and smelly. Yeah, that's exactly and, yeah. right. It's like you're not pronouncing your status with yeah. your lunch bucket. You don't bucket. have a Barbie lunch box. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they named him Lunch Bucket which he wasn't very happy about. Yeah. Well, that was a mistake. He should have taken it with a smile. And then he was always peevish and irritable. And if you asked him to do something, he'd whine. And so like, hmm. this was soon after I joined the Royal, Royal Rail Crew. Well, soon, there was about 60 men on this crew. It stretched out about a quarter of a mile down the tracks. Soon, anonymous harassers were throwing pebbles at him during work. We had hard hats on. So the game was, let's see if we can hit a lunch bucket in the in the hard hat with a pebble. because Anonymous, it makes it nice anonymous. Uh, yeah, well, because you don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. And, and that was purposeful because he didn't, couldn't take a joke. It's like, well, let's see if he can take this joke. Clunk, and everybody go, ha, ha, <laughs> you know. And then he just got more and more peevish and the pebbles got bigger and bigger. And, you know, a week later, lunch bucket was gone, n having not learned anything right. from the experience. But, you know, the men were testing him out. It's like, can you take a joke? Can you, can you, can you be useful? Can you at least be amusing? You're like, mm -hmm. can, is there something worthwhile about you? It's like, no. It's like, okay, well then you're out of here because you never know when we actually might need to depend on you. The nicknames that 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 are in the SEAL teams, like I can't with good conscience <laughs> repeat them. I'm sure that's because true. Because they're just they're just horrible, yeah, horrible yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. But there's a camaraderie around that and there's also the way as i was reading what you had written about these guys working on a railway railway, railway crew yeah there's a test it's a test yeah, yeah. it's a test to see where you're at that's what right. you're made of that's right. can, can we rely on can, you can, can you re can you tolerate a little bit of irritation if the answer to that is no it's like well maybe we don't want you around then because some irritating things are likely to come down the pipe yeah and it's it's not just um it, it, to me to me it proves if you've got someone that can take it right it's not just that they can take some random joking insults. Like they can, they can, can take it. They can take it. Yeah, that's what you're testing for. Yeah. It's like, can you take it? Lunch bucket couldn't, right? Because people would laugh at his lunch bucket and he'd get all upset. It's like, well, you have a stupid lunch bucket. It's like, you know, your mom packed it. How about you laugh at yourself? Yeah, my mom packed this. I know it's kind of stupid. That would have been the end of it. He would have just had to say that. Yeah. It's like, but I didn't want to hurt her feelings. It's like, oh, okay, you know. Yeah. Fine, you got your stupid lunch bucket, and, but no, he couldn't handle that, you know. So yeah, it was it was horrible and comical to watch at the same time because the level of and people have written me about that and they said, oh, you know, poor lunch bucket. It's like because they're all compassionate. I think no, no, not poor lunch bucket. It's like, clue the hell in, buddy. You yeah. had your chance. You know that was a desirable job that rail crew job in the summer because it was high paying, you know, and it, they weren't easy to come by those jobs. And so the fact that he got hired onto that crew was a real opportunity for him. You could make a pile of money in the summer at working on the rail crew. And all you had to do was take some ribbing with good grace, not suck up to the management too badly, and not have other people do your job. That was all. That was all you had to do. But he couldn't do that. And so he got run off. And it was like, grow the hell up, buddy. You know, these guys, oh, when a hundred people are teasing you, then probably they're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when yeah. you are getting teased like that as well, it, well, when you when you when you stop reacting, it's no longer fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Well, it actually, also gives you an op.
opportunity to tease back. It's like yeah. you can show your wit. And one of the things that working class guys in particular, which is what one of the things I really loved about working class jobs, is they're they're always looking for some humor. So it's like if if person A is teasing person B, that's kind of comical. But if person B comes back with a good Singer. comeback, it's like <laughs> that's even better, you know. So I think that's a lot of how those jobs are rendered tolerable, right? It's they're they're hard. Dirty jobs. Right. Dishwasher is a good example. That's not dangerous. Although, cooking is, is you know, you got to watch your step. I got burned a lot when I was cooking, um, but what makes those jobs not only tolerable but even desirable is that you can develop a tremendous amount of camaraderie around them. I've never really experienced that at a professional level job. That just doesn't happen the same way, and it's really there's a real loss in that. So. It's 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 fun to be part of a team that's doing, you know, grubby hands-on things and and having a ridiculously entertaining, vicious, cruel, and evil time while you're doing it. That's very entertaining. I had an experience with that about three years ago. I put my videos up online and. People kept saying that I sounded like Kermit. <laughs> and I thought, well, one person said it, and I thought, well, whatever. But then, like five people said it, and I thought, oh my God, like this Kermit thing. So then I went and listened to Kermit, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> it's like, it's like really, I really sound like Kermit, you know. And so then, well, then I started to play with it a little bit, you know. I used the puppet, and mm -hmm. when I when I when I went to speak to university students, and I made frog jokes, and then I made a vid, I made a couple of videos. <laughs> that sort of featured me as a frog. And I mean, it's crazy, right? It's ridiculous. But but that's, and but but the teasing never got mean because of that, you know? Yeah. And the same things happened online to a larger degree as people keep making memes of me. Like, and there's, I don't know, there's lots of them. There's way too many to even keep track of. And I was watching that happen and I thought, okay, this is a good thing because there's humor and wherever there's humor, that's a good thing. And they're making fun of me, but it's gentle. You know, most of it was pokey, you know, like, well, you sound like this damn puppet. What do you think of that? It's like, well, if I had to pick someone to sound like, it probably wouldn't be a puppet. But if it had to be a puppet, Kermit's not a bad one. It could be a lot worse. Like, it could be Miss Peggy. Yeah. Yeah. It could have been that, you know, so thank God that didn't happen. But the memes have never got vicious because, you know, I'll post them if they're funny and satirical. And then they won't get vicious because they don't have to. It's like, can we poke fun at you? It's like, yeah, please do. And the more the better, really, because that'll also help keep my feet on the ground and keep me awake. And plus it's funny. And like, one of the things about life is that a sense of humor, that's a good thing to, to arm yourself with because sometimes you just don't have anything other than that. If you're going to face a threat, if you face it voluntarily, what happens is your body activates itself for exploration and mastery. But if you face it involuntarily, same size threat, then you, 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 you revert to prey, prey mode and you're frozen. And that's way, way, way more stressful. It's way harder on your body. And so it's better to keep your eye open and watch for emergent threats. Because you all know, you know, what you're not doing quite right and where your life is likely to unravel. You all have a sense of that. And the best thing to do is to not ignore that, to pay attention to it, to watch it, and to take corrective action early. And then, you know, you stay on top of things. And things, your little trip to the underworld might be a few minutes long instead of a catastrophe that produces post-traumatic stress disorder, knocks you out for four or five years, and maybe you never recover. So, and that's, you know, that's what these kind of symbolic representations mean. It's, those are states of being that, that, that indicate being devoured, and you can be devoured by your own unconscious. Jesus, that happens all the time. What does that mean? Well, you know, and it's an autonomous thing in some sense, you know, like if you, if you get depressed or if you get really anxious, you don't have any control over that. It's like it sweeps up over you and pulls you down. Why down? Well, down is where you go when you're sad. You don't go up. Man, I'm up today. Oh, that's too bad. No, it's man, I'm down today. And well, that's partly this, and it's partly because this is subordinate, and it's partly because down is closer to the ground and farther from the sky like there's all sorts of reasons you're feeling down rather than up up is where you're aiming right you aim up you don't aim down